having this retrospective at the Photographer's Gallery in London, especially here because A, it's London, it's where I've been living for many years, and it's also quite incredible to have bodies of work stretching back through all these decades, all in one show. I've never seen anything like this in my case, to have it all put together and to realize that, yeah, maybe it does make sense uh, what I've managed to do over the years. On the other hand, there's a certain sadness about it because it seems to be also marking a, an end of some kind or some kind of completion. And, and so uh, where does that leave me with my founding question of what does it mean to be a gay man of Indian origin? You know, have I answered that? Uh, is there more to be said? Uh, and yes, there is more to be said. It's taken me a while to figure this out, that in fact, uh, uh, us here in the West, we, we assume our knowledge systems to be the best, and uh, we've ignored more localized and indigenous knowledge systems. And maybe the question that now needs to be asked is what do uh, queer people in India itself think in their own languages and in their own knowledge and in their own cultural background what it means to be queer to them. Friends and Lovers uh, on this wall here uh, came about primarily because there was a project brewing in Toronto. To make this show I was looking for something that was both Canadian content-wise and also uh, LGBT content-wise and I thought it was a great excuse for me to make public this particular time in my life when I was sort of in transition, uh, having arrived in Canada as a migrant at 15, having realized that my Indian identity was not very useful in, in the high school I arrived at. And at the same time, I was finding out that my homosexual activity suddenly had a, had a name uh, and something called gay liberation had started. Because I arrived in Canada in 1969, literally a month or two after Stonewall happened. So by 1970, people were all coming out and I had a movement to join. And I went from being a very unfashionable Indian lad to being a very fashionable homosexual just in one year and primarily my sense of family got enlarged out of simply the tribal biological Indian family which in India is like a really big deal. You marry within it, you live within it, they are your support system. I made these pictures really just for myself, it's a kind of extended family album, well for all of us. Uh, I was a kind of uh, DIY budding photographer. I taught myself through the Time Life books and uh, I found I had all this willing subject matter, these people, and I would make prints for them. It was just for us. It wasn't for public consumption. I was studying business at the time in Montreal and one of my buddies from business school was Cheryl, who's in this picture, and uh, my parents, who I was trying to introduce to the idea that I was now gay and uh, trying to educate them and they were refusing to be educated, although I gave them a reading list and everything. Uh, but basically their idea was that very soon after this, I would marry an Indian girl of their choice. So instead I would bring Cheryl home and say, well, how about Cheryl? And they would really freak out at the thought of me having black babies. And they thought, oh, well, in that case, maybe a white guy is a slightly better idea than a black woman. And then I moved to New York. The boyfriend moved to New York to work for a bank. I followed, uh, re-enrolled in a business school to do a master's. And just by being in New York City, there was this constant parade of uh, gay men, very out and proud and dressed up and promenading, as it were, and they wanted to see and be seen and so I would go and shoot pictures there constantly for a while and uh, it was also a time between 
the gay liberation of Stonewall and before the onset of AIDS, when people were very happy, proud and promiscuous as gay liberation had told us to be. And it was a time of too many men and not enough time, literally. And so I began to use the camera as a way of having everybody without actually having to stop and have sex with them. I could do it in a flash of a second just by taking a picture. There's like, yeah, I've done that one like that. So I built up a whole collection. Kind of uh, saw myself in them, although I didn't, obviously, because there are no Indians here to be seen. They weren't out. So I think at this point, uh, I was very gay identified and the race thing hadn't come up. I didn't stop to think that, gee, this is a bunch of mostly white guys. That was not an issue then. It was the fact that they were gay and they were out and happy. That was the main thing. And uh, so really, also I wasn't studying them, you know. I didn't do it like an outsider. This is not a group of people I was making some kind of photographic project about. So in a tribal way, these were my people. And so I felt very equivalent to the subject. In a way, Christopher Street is my family. I'm never alone. Everywhere I go in the world, I find a Christopher Street. So I'm never really alone that way. This person in this picture wrote to me directly himself saying, I'm still alive because the presumption for most people is that most of these people are now dead from AIDS. He said, no, no, I'm still alive and can I have a print? It's also nostalgia in terms of photography because I felt completely carefree in taking this kind of, making these kind of pictures back in the 70s, something that I might have some ethical issues about doing today. Uh, that's what photography education and the last 30 years has taught me. Uh, it's not always okay to go around taking pictures of everyone. In 1983, at the degree show at the RCA, in which we had a black student show, and by black we meant people, anybody who had been uh, a former British colony. It's this experience in the UK of uh, race politics that I encountered at the RCA, actually, and then led me to the GLC, brought race very much to the fore, and suddenly began to inform the gay side, and I'm suddenly thinking, well, where are the black gay people suddenly? And also my sense of being Indian became subsumed in the larger, more global political struggle against the British or rather the English Empire. We like to pr present a very unified uh, public face, but there were a lot of tensions simmering inside. There were tensions between all kinds of subcultures, you know, uh, Asians thought this way, some Asians didn't think they were black, they thought they were white, you know, like that. And then there were tensions between Africans and Caribbeans. There were, there were tensions between even different islands in the Caribbean. But that's all was kind of buried to present a unified black face. So I thought, uh, I'm going to do my 10 pictures about South Asians because nobody else will, so I should do that as my subject. And then inside that, each picture represented a certain kind of British Asian black person. So each one is a kind of uh, uh, type or job. So they had ty simple titles. So that one represented gay. I wasn't taking pictures of people as portraits. It wasn't uh, literally about a single person. It was something generic as what they represented. Uh, this I label writer, but in fact it's Hanif Qureshi. I don't say it's Hanif Qureshi. That's, I just said writer, uh, just to say that Asians write novel. <coughs> this I just called family because that's the classic biological family. Uh, this was the corner store. The immigrant. Uh, again, the person in this picture was very well known face. She was the first Asian female actor in EastEnders. Yes, my own relationship uh, kind of came to an end right when I thought everything was going fine. It was 1984 
I had overcome the various visa problems, I had the right to stay in the UK, and everything should have been fine, and then suddenly everything wasn't fine. And I was kind of a bit devastated, and very, also very dependent on this partner. So I kind of had to start again on my own, and I thought, I had this great sense of uh, failure, and I thought there is something I don't know, so again I turned to the camera, uh, as I've done at various points in my life, as a tool to investigate this issue, and I began to seek out gay couples uh, who I could speak to, and I stumbled upon this excuse to make a portrait of them in their home as a, as a way of getting access to some private time with them and then I would have a chat about what keeps their relationship going. I was really getting seriously involved with black arts so the next question was, again, race and how does that play out in a gay couple? So I began to photograph couples of, who, are, who came from different cultural backgrounds who were together and to make them uh, more theatrical in the sense that uh, they didn't have to be actual real couples. As the series developed, I began to kind of give it a, some narrative thread. So I was very conscious of the racial experience and then at the same time uh, the government had introduced something called Clause 27 that became Clause 28 and that basically said that local authorities were forbidden from funding any activities that might present homosexual relationships as a pretended family relationship. That was extremely troubling because it meant that a lot of the work that I did which was not for the commercial world, it was funded by local authorities largely, and that, that would be cut off. So uh, the whole thing was a kind of outrage. I began to go to demonstrations against this clause, and it became a, a different kind of body of work. And uh, I added two elements to it. One was uh, bits of the demonstration pictures, and then at the same time, I decided to include these poems which were being written by my partner who at this point had moved to New York to do a PhD. I would put this poetry, the staged portrait pictures and the demonstrations together in some form and I took the liberty of cutting the, my picture, the demonstration pictures and just using a bit of them and not worrying about having the whole frame and making a kind of collage. The original collages were made, of course, pre-digital. I'd make the whole print and then cut out something with a scalpel, just stuck it on. From Here to Eternity became the title because uh, it came from this body of work, which was referring to my HIV status. Uh, the day I was diagnosed, I really did think that was it. Uh, and it's something that I've managed to live with. You try to be discreet about it, not bring it up all the time, but uh, it's always there. So uh, I'm grateful for every day that I have in a way that I might not have been otherwise, so uh, every moment feels like eternity. I was trying to recreate uh, uh, some idea of the cut from cinema, of trying to put two things next to each other in time, um, and I came up with this diptych idea, uh, and these pairs I uh, thought uh, should reflect some aspects of my HIV. Uh, so obviously one side has become my own body and what's happening to it in relation to the illness. And I juxtaposed them on the other side with uh, facades of gay nightclubs. There was a proliferation of gay sex clubs, which was very curious to me because 
When I first came to this country, it seemed Victorian. You couldn't hold anybody's hand in a gay pub. And then suddenly, by the mid-90s, you walk into one of these places, and you, you drop your knickers at the door, and you stand around just in your boots. And so uh, I shot these pictures in the daytime when they are shut. And so there's an ambiguity there. And the question for me is, do these sex clubs and their gay patrons, are they shutting me inside for good? Or am I being shut outside for good? Because as an HIV person, I suddenly felt extremely unwanted uh, by my own community. You know, there was a period uh, when I thought my sex life was over. I was having a bit of a meltdown. Not only was I unwell, but the, un the consequences of being unwell in this way meant I couldn't have sex. I was losing my income. I was freelance. I was becoming very poor. Uh, there was a point at which I couldn't physically leave my home for six months because I wasn't well enough. Uh, I became very dependent on friends and was barely functioning in the way that I should have been. And I was in my 40s when I thought I would be at my peak. So it was all a kind of big shock to me. So some kind of therapy was urgently required. And especially in the area of the body, because I really thought nobody wants my body anymore. It was kind of quite literal like that. And remember, I came from this gay identity background where a lot of promiscuous sex was my identity. To be unwanted was like terrible. Typically, there's always some man appears in my life. So this Indian man appeared in India and said, you know, we must get together. So I picked up my suitcase and I moved to India suddenly in 2005, by which time the Indian man who invited me had already lost interest. But I'd left London in such a dramatic way. I said, goodbye to everyone. I'm going back to my country. You can all, you know, deal with yourselves here. And so I really couldn't do a U-turn and come back. I had to make the most of it then. In Delhi, I found uh, my biological family uh, wasn't just my parents and my first cousins, but actually stretched to 500 living people. So I thought, wow, now that's, there's a kind of story in that. And I decided uh, uh, that was worth looking at in some way. And from my earlier days with photography, there have been various modernist photographers who have always stayed in my mind and who I turn to for inspiration. And one of them is Paul Strand, and he had published a book years ago uh, about an Italian village called Un Paese. And I used that book as a role model because my father actually was born and raised in an Indian village. and. Uh, as a middle child, he'd been shoved off to the military and had never gone back to live. But he maintained a connection, and annually he had taken me there. And so unusually for uh, an urban child, I had a familial connection to a landscape, to an actual landscape, to actual rural landscape and farming, uh, going back for a few hundred years. So. Uh, I, just, I made a work trying to connect the Paul Strand idea of the village and this village because I had, a, I had a kind of access again in a very personal way. So again, it didn't have, it's not a study. You know, I'm not an outsider trying to understand India. Again, this is my tribe. It literally is my tribe, you know, so. I kind of try to reflect on this journey uh, back to this village a journey I had always made with my father. And I called it country because it's a kind of, again, a double thing of, uh, it's a bit like pretend families. So this country like in countryside, like town and country, and it's also country like in nation. So this is that, for them, this is the nation. So uh, when they imagine India, this is what they imagine. Uh, not the kind of thing I imagine, which is populated by gay bars and people like that. 
six months ago, we all lived in a very systematic world that we understood and we understood our place in it and the work that we did. And a virus came and it's upended the whole thing. Suddenly we don't know anymore what we do has any meaning at all. You know, so, and we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if it's going to be over in the winter this year or next year or when or if ever and what the consequences of that are going to be. Uh, so I'm, the new work that I make is often around this anxieties that people are feeling. The significance of the ordinary and the everyday shouldn't be lost in the kind of dramas that the news media tends to confront us with about Trump and Boris Johnson and all that. They're not important. It's our everyday stories that are important.